I'm from Toronto, uh, but Handong University is not a strange place for me because I have been coming almost every year to teach at the, uh, at the graduate school. Um, but this time, I've been here for about two months um, on a short sabbatical, and I'm in the, in the midst of writing a book. And, uh, so I'm very happy to be here. And uh, are you happy to be here this morning? You don't seem all that happy because your singing is not as strong. Uh, I, I, did you study all night last night? I know being in university, uh, you're always uh, lacking in sleep. Uh, lack, you lack in energy uh, because you, you're inundated with so many papers and so many books to read, etc., etc. But this morning, I want you to relax. And I want you to be really um, uh, encouraged, but at the same time, challenged by the Word of God. Uh, now, I have been given this topic. I would normally not choose this topic to talk about this heavy uh, matter of, of, of sin. But I'm very glad that I have been given this topic because it also gives me a chance to reflect on my own life and... Um, and, 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 and be really cautious about what sin can possibly do to our lives. Uh, just last week, I learned, and usually I'm very good at these things, but I've learned that about a month ago, uh, something happened that I did not know about, uh, that a prominent Christian leader in this country, a man of full compassion, a deep compassion to bring about change not in not only in church but in also in the soci in society suddenly was forced to step down from all leadership because as a married man he had a secret affair with somebody for many years and he was only recently discovered so he wrote on his sns how sorry he was to his family and as particularly to his wife uh, and said that he is not sure whether he can fully recover from this. Now, it came as a shock. It shouldn't come as a shock because there's so many of, of these uh, uh, things that are happening, but it really came as a shock because this particular person had been maintaining a very clean image uh, of what a Christian should be. And uh, he was at the forefront of the Me Too movement in Korea. And uh, he was also very courageous in demanding a very well-known pastor to admit his sexual sins against women. Ah, so this is, it comes as like a double blow. Now, we have seen just too many moral failures that have plagued the church and deeply affected people's view of the church. And they are just simply too many to talk about and too painful to get into detail. As people of God, uh, I think it's very important that we need to learn how to heed from the failures of others and ensure that we do not stumble in a similar way. Now, I want to begin by saying that in the scripture today, no one is immune to sin and temptation. Now, I want you to look at the passage. The passage does not start by saying, if you are tempted. It doesn't say that. What does it say? It's translated as, when you are tempted. So, what does that tell us? You can count on temptation tempting you. It will happen. How many of you have not been tempted last week? You see, we're always tempted. I'm sure when you were writing paper, oh, yeah, this, I like this sentence. Maybe I, I, I should just write it straight in my own paper. Now, that's called plagiarism. And that's a serious academic offense. I also teach in Toronto, uh, back in Toronto, and when I come across anything like this, and these days it's so easy to detect. Some students are stupid. They think that professors are stupid. 
But most professors are not stupid. These days when, you know, you can tell because you're grading a paper and uh, a lot of these sentences don't make sense. But all of a sudden, this particular sentence, this particular paragraph shines. And you are so impressed. And then you realize, wait a minute, why is there this, this, this discrepancy? And so what you do is you type in one sentence on the Google, you know, and sure enough, the entire book opens up. And then the feeling of being dis- de- betrayed is just so hard to take. How dare does this student try to deceive me? You see, we are, we are tempted. So I want, I want us to, 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 to look at this passage and by noticing that it does not say if you are tempted. It says when you are tempted. Therefore, remember that nobody is immune to sin and temptation. Now, when it comes to this topic of sin and temptation, outright, I want to say, that we have to avoid two extreme, extreme positions. The first is this unwarranted triumphalism. Thinking that, oh, sin and temptation will never, never really get me. It will not happen to me, and it's not something I need to even worry about. I don't need to spend time thinking about it, studying about it, and examining myself about it. That extreme, triumphant attitude is something we need to watch out. But then we also need to watch out for the other extreme. This is the attitude of defeatism. I am doomed. I am forever doomed. I can never get out of this sin and temptation. It's always with me. It's just going to cover me up. It's going to suffocate me. Now, both assumptions are unrealistic and dangerous. True, no one is immune to sin and temptation, but we have loving God who wants to deliver us from sin and temptation and who has given us the Holy Spirit who lives in us and who helps us. Do you believe this? Amen? So, when we are tempted, we must not lose hope. We are definitely not forever doomed. There is a way out. There is a way out. Now, let's continue with the scripture. It says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. I think we need to differentiate Temptation from trial. There's a difference between temptation and trial. Temptation, as we understand it, comes from the devil, the father of lies. Uh, How many of you have read any works by C.S. Lewis? Ah, Amazing. And I'm sure you have come across this little book called Screwtaped Letters. Uh, In case those... You have a, uh, those of you who haven't read this, I really encourage you to come across and read it. It's about the senior devil instructing the junior devil in the art of tempting humans. Even just the idea is so refreshing. But uh, if, when you go through that book, you realize, wow, devil is alive. And devil is out to really tempt people. So, we should differentiate between temptation and trial in that temptation comes from the devil, the father of lies, and uh, its goal is to defame, to defile, and to destroy us. That's it. No more, no less. That's the end goal. Whereas trial does not come from Satan, but comes from God. Its purpose is to refine our character, to strengthen our character so that we can be used by God's, God for his glory. 
So we should really differentiate between the two. Now, we need to understand sin and temptation. Sin and temptation always come in steps. And there is a fine line between temptation, where temptation ends, and where sin begins. Nonetheless, we need to understand and recognize this fine line and make sure that we make the right choice not to give in to temptation. Martin Luther, who is no stranger to temptations, said that he couldn't stop the birds from flying over his head, but he could prevent them from building a nest in his hair. Now, that's the difference between temptation and sin. Now, for those of you, uh, I can relate to uh, young men because I went through that stage in my life where you have a lot of hormones bubbling all over. When you see a, a beautiful woman walking by, there's nothing much you can do about that. You know what I'm saying? You can only praise God and say, God, you made this woman to be very, very beautiful. Beautiful and wonderful. There's, there, there's nothing much you can do about it. But if you go a little further and begin to struggle and begin to act upon your lustful thoughts, now you're crossing the line. And now you're getting into trouble. So to put what Luther said in another way, when you see birds flying over you, there's not much you can do about it. But the birds, if the birds are trying to build a nest in your hair, well, then you should go away. You should not allow the birds from building it. Now, I want us to look at one case study in the Old Testament. Now, if you have the Bible with you or your cell phone, please Open, open it up to 2 Samuel chapter 11. And I want to take you through each step and show you that sin and temptations just do not just happen, but they come in steps. And therefore, we need to really understand where temptation ends, where sin begins. And I pray that uh, this morning, some of you are really struggling with sin and temptation. May the Spirit speak to you this morning and deliver you from that anxious thoughts and possibly that path that leads to destruction. Now, go to Second Samuel chapter 11. It's a story we, are, we grew up listening to in, in Sunday schools. So, Chapter 11 begins with this, these words. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. Now, already, if you are an astute student of the Bible, you can see that the, 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 the writer is, is giving you lots of hint that when something goes wrong, there's usually something else that, proceeds it. So here in verse 1 already you can see. Here's the king. When usually when all kings go off to war, David chose not to go to war. It's like another way of saying when all adults go to, go to work, this particular person chose not to go to work. That kind of idea. So David chose not to go to war and instead sent his general Joab to take his place. So you wonder, what's going on in, in David's world? Maybe he's going through some sort of um, soul-searching times, or uh, at least one thing we can be sure of is that he was at a very vulnerable point in his life, and temptation could enter into his life and play havoc. So, continue on. Now, verse 2, here comes the first step. I'm going to show you nine steps that sin and temptation took to fully destroy David. 
Here's step one. So David gets up uh, out of his bed and walks around on the roof of the palace. Now, in the middle of the night, he can't sleep. You ask, why can't you not sleep? I don't know. David will say, I just can't go to sleep. Okay, well, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, sometimes our body can, condi- maybe you had too much coffee the night before. But whatever the reason, he couldn't sleep, so he takes a walk on the roof of his palace. So far, no problem. Now, from the roof, he sees a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful, the scripture says. So far, there's nothing wrong with it, except when he sees a woman taking a bath, maybe, oh, oh, okay. And then he should have turned around. But I think the suggestion this verse is, 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 is giving to us is that, that he's, he keeps looking at this woman. And that's the problem. This is like what Martin Luther said. You can't really help birds flying over your head. But don't let it build nest in your hair. So here's step one. And then look at um, the next step. He notices a beautiful woman and naked and taking a bath. Well, if you're going to take a bath, you have to take your clothes off. So there's nothing much she could have done about that. But anyway, uh, he goes out of his way to gaze upon the beauty he discovered on and on and on. And here is the second step. The fact that he gazed upon her on and on and on. You see, um, when we study sin and temptation, the sooner you get out of these steps, the easier it is to resist and to handle. The deeper you get into it, the more difficult it is to get out. So that's why I'm giving you these nine steps or showing you these nine steps. David could have gotten out earlier on, but he chose not to, and that's his problem. And the third step, what does he do? So the first step was uh, he should have gone to, the, to war when, when, when every other king did, but he chose not to. Second step, he discovers a woman and keeps looking at her. Third step is now he sends somebody to find out who that beauty is all about. Now, that's getting a little too far, isn't it? I mean, that's enough to see a woman, beautiful woman, taking a bath. But why is he sending one of his um, officers to go and find out who that woman is? Again, you can see David, he's now overcome by that temptation. And that sinful nature in him that is, is strongly forcing him to continue, to, to keep going. So, his uh, officer comes back with this news. Sorry, sorry, king. By the way, that is not in the scripture. I'm just ima- imagining that this is what's happening. Sorry, king. She's married. And guess what? She's married to one of your own generals. Now, I think most people would just say, okay, that's enough then. Thank you. Good job. And uh, David would have said, okay, well, back to my, my own work. But uh, David doesn't do that. See, he should have stopped at this point. But notice what sin does to you. It just keeps nagging at you and says, go as far as you can go and see what happens. So the next step now, what is it now? One, two, three, four. The next step is David sends someone to bring this woman in. Now, this is getting really, really bad. He should never have done this. Most people would never do this. But he asks the woman to come in. Now, it's king's order. And so the woman obeys. Now, we read in the scripture today, evil desire gives birth to sin, and sin gives birth to death. You see, it talks about progression. Sin doesn't happen 
just like that. There, there are steps. Anyway, Bathsheba comes to him, and David commits adultery. And his own soldier's wife now is pregnant. See, the plot thickens. Now, what does David do at this point? He realizes, oh, this pregnancy is something I did not expect. But what was he expecting then? Oh, this was not part of my plan. But now that she's pregnant, I need to cover this up. See, sin begets sin. Sin has a way of multiplying itself. See, when you lie, small thing, in order to cover up that lie, you have to create even more, bigger lie. And then to cover up that lie, now you have to have another lie. And before you know it, your life is full of lies. That's why you have, have to have this policy that honesty is the best policy. I will not lie. If it gets me into trouble now, let it be so. I will not allow this small lie to eventually overtake me. Now, what does David do? He tries to cover up by now bringing Uriah, the general, from the battlefield. He recalls him and encourages him to go home and sleep with his wife. Well, trying to cover up that later on this pregnancy was, was to do with the fact that her husband happened to be home uh, because the king called him back. And that's when this pregnancy took place. Now, this was the calculation David had in mind. Mm. You see, the problem is this. You may fool people, but God cannot be fooled. Amen? Why are you so depressed this morning? I know this topic is heavy. We can deceive people. We can deceive even people that are very, very near us. But we cannot deceive God. Therefore, in the Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right? Koram Deo, in the face of God. This is how we are to live our lives. Even when no one is looking, God is looking. Well, David orders Uriah, okay, I want you to go home and enjoy the company of your wife today because you worked really hard. I want to give you some rest. The Bible says Uriah did not go home. Where did he spend the night? He spent the night just outside the palace gate. Here is a trustworthy faithful general, totally committed to his own king. And yet, his own king is totally unfaithful to him. I remember um, uh, listening to Elizabeth Elliot one time when I was at a conference. She was one of the speakers. Uh, this goes back 30 years ago. And uh, Elizabeth Elliot, by the way, she is the, the, the husband of Jim Elliot. You know these, these names? Yes. So Elizabeth Elliot was one year older than Jim Elliot, both attending uh, Wheaton College. So she was uh, graduating first, but she had crush on Jim Elliot. So on the graduation day, everybody came, friends came, Jim Elliot came. So Elizabeth Elliot took the courage and went up to Jim and said, here's the e yearbook. Would you please sign it? Now, she always wanted to go out with Jim, but never had the courage to ask. And Jim was a, a state wrestler, a Greek scholar, and not, I'm not so sure if, whether he was very handsome, but, but he was very well built and so on. So Elizabeth Elliot always wanted to um, 
have a relationship with him. Well, here is Jim scribbling on the yearbook, 2 Timothy 2.4. Guess how long it took for Elizabeth to dash, to run to her dormitory and open up the Bible. Well, she did. And the verse says something to this effect. No one serving as a soldier gets into a civilian affair. He wants to please his commanding officer. Uh, I can go on about that story, but I will stop that right there. I'm always reminded of that story each time I think about David and Uriah. Uriah was a faithful general that wanted to please his ultimate commanding king. How could I go home and enjoy the company of my wife when the whole people, my people, my army, are at a battle? So he chose not to. Now David, his plan was crushed. He wanted to cover up this pregnancy by having Uriah sleep with Bathsheba, but that never happened. So now what does David do? Here, here's another step, another deeper step that David plunges into. Now he hatches a plot to have Uriah killed. Very, very bad, bad plan. How? He sends the soldier general back to the battlefield and orders Joab. Okay, put him at the very front line and have him fight. But all of a sudden, withdraw all the support. So here is, again, I'm imagining. Here is Uriah, like fighting and saying, come on, guys, come on, let's fight. As he's fighting, he looks back and there's nobody. Only he's fighting. And so there he's killed in the battlefield. You can see David, King David, he's, pardon my expression, but he's a scumbag. This is not a king with the kind of character that we know from reading his Psalms. And we're totally disappointed. But this is what sin does to you. You see, you become out of character. You do things you would never think of possible. Why? Because you want to cover up. You want to cover up your mess. And the more you cover up, the bigger cover up you need. And finally, after Uriah is killed, David takes Beersheba as his own wife. There are at least nine steps that I counted. And each time there is a clear knowledge that David was making a choice. And each time he was getting deeper and deeper into the sin and the destruction that followed. But remember, at the same time, he had a choice to pull out. He had a choice to pull out at each step. He had nine opportunities. But this is what sin does to you. Sin finally takes over you. And you do things You don't understand. You do things you don't like. You do things that you know will eventually kill you. John Owen, the 17th century Puritan, dedicated his entire life understanding human nature, especially the sinful nature. He wanted to understand sin and the sinful nature. What sinful nature does to us and how we are to overcome this sinful nature. He uses this expression, the mortification of sin. You need to mortify sin. Now, that's an an interesting phrase. You You have to kill sin. You have to mortify, mortification of sin. But what he means by killing sin is not what you and I might think. He is not saying we need to go out actively, Get rid of sin and temptation in our lives. You have to fight it with your own strength. That is not what he's saying. If you do that, you may have a temporary victory over sin. But don't be deceived. Sin may say, okay, I lost round one. See you in round number two. 
In other words, John Owen taught that we should be careful not to fight sin with our sinful nature. We cannot. We will be defeated. Instead, we must learn to yield our life over to God and to allow God to take control over our sinful nature. This is what Paul says in Galatians 5.16. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful, sinful nature. So, in other words, what, what we need to do is we must, when tempted, we must learn how to invite the Holy Spirit to take hold of the situation. We are not encouraged to fight sin with our own strength. But we are to fight sin by inviting the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you, what is your weak area? What area do you tend to be tempted more? Richard Foster wrote a book some time ago titled Money, Sex, and Power. I think that pretty well sums, sums up. So, in this one of the three areas, if not all three, which area do you get tempted most often? You see, one way to fight, one way to allow the Spirit to really uh, fight sin in our lives is understanding when we are tempted, how we are tempted, and then praying to the Spirit to help us, to guide us. In the meantime, if... Money is the area that I am tempted, tempted quite often. Learn, by the help of the Holy Spirit, learn to live simple lives. Do not allow material things, do not allow money to get to you. And how you do that? Even by forcefully practicing simple living. Learn to share. Learn to give. And learn that life is not full of these things. That there are more and better things in life than material goods. If power is something that you are tempted quite often, then ask the Holy Spirit to give you a humble spirit. And instead of enjoying when, whenever you are in, in a situation to lord over people, Remember Jesus, who served us on the cross. Choose words, choose deeds that are humble and not arrogant. So place yourself by the help of the Holy Spirit to be in a servant position. If sex is the area that, that you are tempted the most, pray for the Holy Spirit's guide, guide in your life. You need to really watch out. And one way is get out of the situation that is likely to tempt you. Earlier, the better. We, we saw in the life of David. Overall, the best defense is the off offense. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So, if you are busy, if you are committed to his kingdom, then God will take care of your temptations. So I pray that you will heed these words, you will heed from the failure of David, that sin and temptation come in steps, and that the sooner you get out, the better off you are. And if you don't get out, eventually it will kill you. Temptation leads to sin and sin to death. Let us pray. Now this morning, if there are anyone who is really struggling with certain temptations or sins, let me pray for you. And let us all pray for you as well. That the Spirit will deliver you. The Spirit will speak to you. 
that God of glory will shine upon your lives. Father, we do not want to take this lesson lightly. We do not want to take what happened to David lightly. And we know from your word that David had to pay the price for the choices he's made. Lord, we pray that you will protect us from the evil one. That you will protect us, not just us, but the family we belong to, the community that we are part of, and the kingdom that we want to help proclaim together. Lord, I pray particularly this morning, those of us who are struggling with temptations and sins, may the Spirit strengthen them. May the Spirit make it very clear what is at issue, what is at stake. Guide us, protect us, lead us from all temptation, lead us into your truth. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.